Madam President, some of my Democrat colleagues will want you to believe that any opposition to their agenda is evil and unjustified. They have claimed for weeks that mere questions about the $95 billion, $95 billion bill the Senate is now considering a rooting in some radical right-wing anti-democracy conspiracy. And the liberal press prints these lies as gospel. I think this process has destroyed the Senate, ignores the history of our great nation. One of the first decisions facing our new republic was whether to engage in the conflict raging between French revolutionaries and an alliance of European nations led by Great Britain. As we all know, President George Washington ultimately decided to remain neutral in that conflict, knowing that our new nation was not prepared to assume the grand responsibilities of supporting a cause, no matter how noble, while properly attending to the pressing matters facing his new government here at home. America was cash-strapped and war-weary. War weary. In the centuries that have passed that moment, our great nation has evolved. The United States has grown to the leader of the free world, the true global superpower, representing the ideals of liberty, freedom, and democracy, and standing staunchly against oppression and tyranny or wherever it is found. We no longer must wrestle with these decisions, these decisions the ways our founders did, but we still face tremendous domestic challenges that I'm sure Washington, Hamilton, Jefferson could have never imagined in April of 1793. Today, we are once again cash-strapped and war-weary. Like never before, Americans are questioning whether their federal government has lost its way, now fails to represent the people they elected. Less than 25% of the country believes we are on the right track. Decades of politicians in Washington being addicted to earmarks, and pushing reckless fiscal policy have decimated the fish financial health of our great nation. The United States has more than $34 trillion in debt, soon to exceed $35 trillion, and a budget deficit projected this year of nearly $1.8 trillion. Since 2019, the U.S. population has increased just 1.8 percent, but our federal budget is set to increase by 55 percent. Surprise to many, federal revenues were down over 9 percent last year. In the last three months, we have lost nearly 1.6 million full-time jobs. Part-time part -time jobs are up. More than 850,000 Americans are more, as more Americans can't find full-time work and have to work multiple jobs to make ends meet. Biden's bad economy and reckless policies have created massive inflation. It is up 17 percent since he took office. It's causing immense pain for families every day, especially our poor families like mine growing up. Unfortunately, the world's evil regimes and tyrants do not wait for the United States to be in our top fighting and fiscal shape to launch their attacks. And the weakness and appeasement of the Biden administration has emboldened them to seek so, so chaos in nearly every corner of the world. Iran and its proxies like Hamas, the Houthis, and Hezbollah are waging war against Israel and fighting to destroy the Jewish state and its people. Russia continues its war in Ukraine, creating instability not seen in Europe since World War II. And Communist China continues to threaten the United States and prepare for an invasion of Taiwan that will upend world trade and destabilize the Indo-Pacific even further. While chaos continues abroad, Americans' national security is also being threatened every day by invasion of single adult males at our own borders. One that President Biden's lawless actions have created, encouraged, and maintained. This is the sad reality for a nation under the weak leadership of Joe Biden. It's forced this body to deal with world events in a way that, are, that I'm sure many of us completely dislike. I say all this to put the moment we find ourselves in today into the honest context it deserves, but is so often ignored or purposely manipulated by Democrats and their allies in the mainstream media. The United States cannot ignore the massive threats we face to our national security and prosperity that I have just outlined. I hope, on that, I hope that we all can agree. But as this body so often does, especially under the control of our Democrat colleagues, this is about to again fail to meet this moment with responsible and appropriate legislation. Rather than negotiating a bill for border security in the public, we are kept in the dark for months and ultimately failed to negotiate a border security deal with Democrats that could actually get Republican support, and passed because it did not require Biden to secure the border. 
This bill completely fails to deliver what most of our conference supported in tying the disbursement of Ukraine aid to real reductions of illegal immigration at the southern border. It was the only way we knew to make Biden do his job. Voters in Florida want a secure border today, inflation to cease, and better paying full-time jobs. Our conference demanded a secure border before we helped Ukraine secure that border only because we thought it was the only way we could get Joe Biden to do his job and secure the southern border. Our conference supported tying the disperse, disbursement of Ukraine aid to real reductions of illegal immigration at our southern border. I remain interested in negotiating and voting for a bill that secures our border now, stops the flow of drugs across our border, and stops more criminals, terrorists, and human traffickers from coming into our communities now in a fiscal responsible manner. When I was in business, I negotiated and closed a lot of deals. And I knew if I couldn't walk away from the table, I would never get a good deal. I also knew that I would never get a good deal if the people sitting across the table from me didn't want the same outcome that I did. We have to walk away from the table until we are negotiating with people who share the same goal as our conference, a secure border today. The result is what we have before us today, a wildly unaccountable foreign aid package that does absolutely nothing to secure the U.S. southern border and could funnel billions in borrowed money to Hamas terrorists and into the salaries of Ukrainian politicians. This bill claims to address the invasion of Ukraine while ignoring the invasion we face right here in the United States. This bill could send billions in borrowed money into Gaza, which is still dominated by the Iran-backed Hamas terrorists who killed 1,200 Israelis and more than 30 Americans and are still holding American hostages. I am unapologetically pro-Israel. I've had the honor of visiting Israel five times as both Florida governor and as a U.S. senator. What happened on October 7th horrified the world and struck me personally. In 2019, my wife Anne and I visited Kafar Azu, one of the kibbutz that was, site to a was a site to a complete massacre. As the early reports were coming out, I was really worried about the kibbutz because of its proximity to Gaza. It's about half a mile away. When I heard the news that it was the site of some of the most horrific and barbaric activities, my heart just sank. I went to vomit. We spent an afternoon there in Kafar Oz, and it was the most peace peaceful place. I kept thinking about the moms and kids who were playing outside, enjoying the warm summer weather. It is gut-wrenching to think of the fate of the families we met that day. I spoke with Chen, the lady who led our tour of the kibbutz, who fortunately was dra traveling outside of Israel that day and survived. I was able to talk with her, and she had not yet been able to go home. She said it was unclear if she will ever be allowed to go back to her home. I can't imagine. So many of us in this chamber are so deeply connected to Israel, and I bet many of you have a story like mine. We know people in the IDF who have been called to serve. We have friends all over Israel who have spent days in bomb shelters as rockets have been launched by terrorist intent on wiping Israel and Jews off the face of the earth. I've met with survivors and hostage families. I placed a poster outside my office that features the faces of the hostages being held by Hamas. I'm not going to take it down until they're home. I've been clear that we cannot see, a, cannot see a ceasefire until every Hamas terrorist is dead. I want every single one of them dead. These monsters beheaded. They beheaded children and babies. They raped girls and burn innocent civilians alive. They dragged innocent people through the streets and are now holding them as hostages in Gaza, which these terrorists absolutely control. It is unimaginable that the United States would ever consider sending money to a place where we know it would be used to help terrorists who are holding American hostages, is exactly what the, and that's exactly what this bill does. I've heard a lot of my Democrat colleagues talk about what's happening in Gaza, and your heart goes out to anybody impacted by war. I wish everybody would start talking more about the hostages. We still have American hostages. And, President, I want to make sure everyone understands exactly what I'm saying here, which is a fact. Every dollar that goes to Gaza directly benefits Hamas. I've spent every day since October 7th telling the stories of those being held hostage in Gaza by Iran-backed Hamas terrorists. I've got a poster outside my office that features the faces of the hostages being held by Hamas, and I'm not going to take it down. Unfortunately, President Biden has not done the same. I can't imagine why the President of the United States isn't speaking every single day about Americans, Americans, being held hostage by Hamas terrorists 
and what he is doing to get them out. The IDF just rescued two American hostages in a mission that the Biden administration urged them not to do. What has Biden done to rescue any hostages? Many of my colleagues will recall the name of nine-year-old Emily Hand. Emily and her father, Thomas, lived in the small kibbutz of Beret, which was ruthlessly targeted and destroyed by Hamas during the attacks. In the days immediately following the attacks, Emily's dad was, was initially told that his daughter, who had spent the night at a friend's house just a few doors down, was killed. And a president, from a father of two daughters and the father of seven grandchildren. Watching this father speak about the murder of his daughter is heart-wrenching. He said to CNN at the time, quote, they just said we found Emily and she's dead. And I went, yes. And I smiled because that is the best news, the possibilities that I knew. She was either dead or in Gaza. And if you know anything about what they do to people in Gaza, that is worse than death. Those are the words of Emily's father. Soon to his relief and horror, Thomas learned that Emily was in fact alive and being held hostage by Hamas. This beautiful, innocent little girl spent 50 days as a hostage in Gaza. While I'm sure that Thomas thanks God every day to have his little girl back in his arms again, he knows that the child he had on October 6th is long gone. Emily will never be the same as she was before she was taken. It's been more than 120 days since the attacks. Some parents are still waiting for their children to come home. Little baby Kafir Bibis. First birthday was spent as a hostage in Gaza. His four-year-old brother, Ariel, is also still being held hostage. I've got a picture of Ariel in a a uh, milk carton, six, okay, four or five milk carton in my office. He's a beautiful little boy. Kafir and Ariel's parents have been waiting for more than four months to hold their babies again. Can you imagine? Now we've heard horrible reports that these innocent children may no longer be alive. Why is Biden giving money to Gazans who are holding American hostages? Why would we allow Biden to give more money to Gazans who are holding Americans hostages? They are holding Americans hostage. When will this stop? Why the heck are we allowing Biden to send more money to Gaza in this bill when we know that every dollar that goes to Gaza funds the terrorism of Hamas? What are we doing to get American hostages released? I'm not going to start stop talking about this fact. Every dollar that goes into Gaza directly benefits Hamas. That is the undeniable truth. It's why I've been fighting for years to pass my Stop Taxpayer Funding the Hamas Act, which prevents U.S. tax dollars from going to Gaza unless the Biden administration can certify that not a single cent will go to Hamas. Any of my colleagues that are interested in having money going to take care of the children in Gaza should want this bill to pass. They shouldn't want any money to go to Hamas. They should want to go to these children. This isn't a solution in search of a problem. It addresses a very real threat of taxpayer money funding Iran-backed terrorism that seeks to destroy Israel. We cannot allow an American family with a family member being held hostage in Gaza to see their tax dollars go to the same people who are holding their family member hostage. We have seen reports that the Palestinian Authority has been paying over $300 million each and every year in monthly salaries to terrorist prisoners and in monthly allowances to families of dead terrorists. The Palestinian Authority pays terrorists and their families should not receive U.S. tax dollars. And this bill will allow more of that. That's insane. In 2021, President Biden's State Department said, quote, we're going to be working in partnership with the United Nations and the Palestinian Authority to, quote, kind of channel aid there in a manner that does its best to go to the people of Gaza, end quote. The official went on to say, quote, as we've seen in life, as we all know in life, there are no guarantees. But we're going to do everything we can to ensure that this assistance reaches the people who need it the most, end quote. The Biden administration thinks that the risk of resources going to Hamas terrorists is okay 
because, quote, in life there are no guarantees, unquote. I completely reject that. I will not leave anything to chance when it comes to preventing U.S. taxpayer money from being sent to the brutal terrorists that have slaughtered so many Israelis and Americans. That's why I wasn't surprised in August 2021 when the Senate voted 99 to 0 for my amendment to a budget bill that would have made the Stop Taxpayer Funding of Hamas Act the law of the land. But as we would learn soon after this vote, the Democrats only voted for it because they knew that in the final text of the bill, written by Democrats, my language would be mysteriously missing. I've tried twice more since then to pass this legislation in the Senate, and the Democrats have blocked it twice. I know that the left has a big problem on its hands, as so many Democrats rally for Hamas and against Israel in the streets of liberal cities and on the campuses of American universities. You would think my Democrat colleagues would be eager to show that Democrats don't support Hamas. Instead, they block my bill, proving that there is no interest in the Democrat Party to stand up to these people who hate Israel. That's why I will be asking today to make an, my amendment to add my Stop Taxpayer Funding of Hamas Act to this bill. I hope Democrats don't again oppose simply going on the record to vote on common sense measures. I hope we get a vote and it passes. We've also tr tried twice to pass a standalone Israel aid bill that would send money, not send money to Gaza, but Democrats blocked that too. Each and every Democrat voted against aid to Israel. So don't tell me or my colleagues who oppose this bill that we don't stand with Israel when Democrats tw twice vote blocked our bill and then all voted against it, which has already passed in the House to immediately send money to Israel. Madam President, let me be clear about one more thing. Since the day that Vladimir Putin launched Russia's unlawful invasion of Ukraine, I've stood strongly on the side of the Ukrainian people. But there are clearly numerous unanswered questions. What has happened to the more than $100 billion of aid that has gone to Ukraine? What is our plan to win? Why are we paying the salaries of Ukraine politicians? Will Biden give Ukraine the weapons they need? Why can't Congress pay for this with savings in other areas? Why is the Ukraine border more important than the U.S. border? Ukraine must win and Russia must lose. There's no question that is what is in the best interest of America's national security. And that's why I've said that we should continue to provide lethal aid to Ukraine, paid for with seized Russian assets, so it can win its war and have a clear plan for how Ukraine will win. We, we need to answer these questions and be strategic about how we protect our interests, especially as we add to America's $34 trillion in debt. The American people will not tolerate borrowing billions of dollars to pay the government expenses and salaries of Ukrainian politicians nor will they tolerate this government having no plan for how Ukraine will win, how American resources will help it win, and how we're making sure that every dollar is spent with one mission in mind, defeating Russia. And concern grows when we see that Ukraine has fired another top military official and seems to be struggling to show a clear path to victory. Without more information, we're left to assume the worst, that this entire bill has no clear mission, but to accomplish the appearance of unity so that American politicians can fly over with a grand, giant check and deliver hollow speeches about moral righteousness. It doesn't soothe our concerns when we hear the majority whip say on this floor that we must pass this bill no now so that he can go to Munich this week and pontificate about a bill that the Speaker of the House has repeatedly stated will never become law. That accomplishes nothing. And if my colleagues were serious about aiding Ukraine in its war against Russia's invasion, they would work with us in good faith to produce a bill that can pass here and in the House. As I said, I want Ukraine to win, and I want Russia to lose. But this does, that mean, this does not mean I, I am or should be willing to simply accept my, any offer thrown down by the Democrats that they claim but cannot prove will advance that cause, or while America is being invaded as a result of our open border. And I will not accept anything that ignores the most urgent threat to U.S. national security, Joe Biden's wide open border. This should not need to be said here on the floor of the United States Senate, but securing Americans' border 
is more important than securing the border of any other country. We should be able to do both. <clears throat> and frankly, the fact that we aren't even aren't, aren't using Russian revenue generated from seized Russian assets to pay for Ukraine aid is ridiculous. And that's how things work here. Your federal government cannot continue to stroke massive checks to borrow more money while providing zero accountability to the American people. I know the people of Florida are sick of it. We're all sick of it. And I think just about every American is sick of it. The deal has always been Ukraine aid for border security, not immigration policy, but real border security now. Florida families are feeling the impact of this administration's lawless border policies every single day. As deadly fentanyl, criminals, and terrorists pour, pour across Biden's open borders. There are 1,145 children between 14 and 18 years old who died from fentanyl in 2021. What is the plan to stop that? That's a classroom of students dying every week. In 2022, I heard from a mom in Kissimmee, Florida, whose son had a future in the Air Force. He was in the Air Force, came home to visit her on Mother's Day weekend, I surprised her. He unfortunately visited an old friend who he didn't know had begun dealing drugs. The friend convinced the young man to take a Xanax, which was unknowingly laced with fentanyl, and the mom found her wonderful son dead. It's heartbreaking. And there are more stories like this. 100,000 Americans died from drug overdoses in 2021, and 72% of those from opioids like fentanyl. Families in Florida and every state across the nation are being torn apart by these deadly drugs coming across the border. What is Joe Biden's plan to stop these drugs from coming across the border? My Democrat colleagues seem to be finally acknowledging this crisis on TV. But unfortunately, they're unwilling to stand up to their president and force him to do what's right. We all know what's right. Secure the border. I can't imagine why. It's, it's obvious to everyone that the invasion of our southern border is what Biden unfortunately wants. Just take a look at the numbers. On January 20, 2021, Joe Biden took office and inherited the most secure U.S. southern border in modern history. In some of his first acts as president, he used his executive power to dismantle the policies that President Trump used to secure the border and send a clear message to the cartels. The border is now wide open for smuggling, and I won't do anything to stop you. The surge of illegal immigration started almost immediately. In February 2021, Right after Biden was inaugurated, there were more than 101,000 encounters, 101,000 encounters of illegal aliens attempting to cross our southern border between ports of entry. If you go to the southern border, what you'll see is you see on the Mexico side, IDs everywhere. They want to come, they don't want anybody to know who they are. If you're up to know, if you're up, if you, if you had a stellar background, would you be doing that? No. That February was a massive increase from what we saw just a prior month. From there, the numbers continued to skyrocket. March 2021 saw 173,000 encounters with illegal aliens between ports of entry. By July 2021, encounters with illegal aliens between ports of entry skyrocketed to more than 213,000. That's more than 213,000 people attempted to illegally enter the United States in just one month. I put this out to make something very clear. The border was secure, and then Joe Biden took office. And the cartels got his message loud and clear. The invasion hasn't stopped since. In fiscal year 2022, the first four full fiscal year under the Biden administration, there were more than 2.3 million encounters with illegal aliens between ports of entries. These aren't families searching for the better life. They're mostly single adults. Of those 2.3 million encounters with illegal aliens at our southern border, one, more than 1.6 million were single adults, most of whom are military-aged men. 
at 70 percent of all people who are trying to illegally enter the United States. Even more terrifying, 98 of the people caught trying to illegally sneak into our country in fiscal year 2020, 2022 were on the terror watch list. Here's another terrible stat for you from that period. CBP seized more, seized more than 14,000 pounds of fentanyl along the southern border. Just two milligrams of fentanyl can be a lethal dose, and they seized more than, four, seized more than 14,000. That's enough fentanyl to kill 3 billion people. This is how much fentanyl has crossed the border without, think about how much fentanyl has crossed the border without being uh, seized. Fiscal year 2023, 2023, things got worse. More than 2.4 million encounters with illegal aliens between ports of entry. Again, these aren't mostly families searching for a better life. They are mostly single adults. Of these 2.4 million encounters with illegal aliens at our southern border, 60% or more than 1.5 million were single adults. Again, most of whom are military-aged men. And 169 people on the terrorist watch list tried to illegally sneak into our country during fiscal year 2023, and we don't know where they are. And the drugs continue to flow into our country. Last year, CBP seized nearly 27,000 pounds of fentanyl along the southern border. That's enough fentanyl to kill 6 billion people. Last December, more than 300,000 illegal aliens were encountered trying to unlawfully enter the United States. This is an invasion and a clear and present danger to the safety of every American. Even Al Sharpton called it an invasion on his MSNBC show last week. But Senate Democrats and Joe Biden still won't do what is needed to fix it. Let me say that again. Biden's open border is a clear and present danger to every single American. In a hearing of the Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee last October, I questioned FBI Director Christopher Wray about the threats that we are facing because of Joe Biden's open border. In his response to me, Director Ray said, we went through a period where the traditional, traditional structured foreign terrorist organization threat in the U.S. subsided. Some in favor of this inspired, ISIS-inspired, let's say, attack. To be clear, that threat has not gone away. What has now increased is Director Ray. Is the greater possibility of one of these foreign terrorist organizations directly attack directing an attack in the United States, in the United States. He went on to say, quote, it is time to be concerned. We are in a dangerous period, unquote. That since Joe Biden took office, quote, this is Director Ray, the terror threats have elevated, unquote. I refuse to ignore this threat or pretend that it is okay to take care of the border in Ukraine while doing absolutely nothing to stop the invasion we have right here in the United States. Madam President, I want to get something done, and I will always believe in the ability of our great nation to answer the call and defend freedom and democracy wherever it is threatened by tyranny. I care deeply about protecting the national security of the United States. At 18, year old, 18 years old, I enlisted in the Navy to defend my country. My adopted father was one of the 3,000 American soldiers who did all four combat jumps with the 82nd Airborne and then fought in the Battle of the Bulge. I know there is evil in the world, and America must be the leader of the free world. There is no one else to rely on, but we have to take care of the families we represent first. We have to secure our border today. This bill does not secure our border and has too many failures to say it will do what's needed to protect America and our interests. This bill allows Biden to send billions to Gaza, which could go straight to Hamas terrorists, and billions to pay the salaries of Ukrainian politicians. That is wrong. We, know, we all know this, that no bill is perfect. It is nearly impossible to write something that all 100 of us love and have no concerns about. But this isn't a situation where we can ignore some, some parts we don't like. Because the truth is that the things I've just outlined not only fund threats to U.S. national security, like giving billions to Gaza that, go, that could go to Hamas, but also recklessly force American taxpayers to borrow billions to pay for the salaries of foreign politicians while U.S. debt skyrockets to more than $34 trillion while doing nothing to secure 
our border. Nothing to secure our border. Nothing to secure the border of the United States where we have drugs, terrorists, criminals, human traffickers flowing across that could impact every one of our families. That is unacceptable. We can and must do better. So today, I'm, I am once again going to ask that the Senate be given the opportunity to vote on my amendment to add the Stop Taxpayer Funding Hamas Act to this bill. And I'm asking for a vote on my amendment. Now, we've heard from colleagues that they were rightly concerned about the citizens of Gaza. If they were concerned about the citizens of Gaza, they should want this bill. They shouldn't want a dime to go to Hamas. They should want a penny to go to Hamas. They should want every dime, every dime, to go to the children that don't have the food they need. But in the meantime, shouldn't we spend more time thinking about the American hostages? Where's the conversation about the hostages? Where, where's the conversation about what are we doing to get the hostages home? What have we heard from Biden? What have we heard from my Democratic colleagues? Nothing. I've said before in this chamber, in August 2021, the Senate voted 99 to 0 for my amendment to a budget bill to ensure that United States tax dollars do not benefit terrorist organizations such as Hamas. It's a no-brainer. The vote was 99 to 0. Everyone in this body seems to agree American taxpayers should never fund Hamas tourists. But they don't want to do anything about it. They want to say it, but do nothing about it. The final text of the bill written by Democrats did not include my language. We all, we all know that Hamas controls Gaza. Every dollar that goes to Gaza comes under the control of Hamas, who decides what to do with it. We must make sure American tax dollars aren't funding terrorists. So what my Stop Taxpayer Funding of Hamas Act does is make it so that no funds will be authorized for the territory of Gaza until the President certifies to Congress that these funds can be spent without benefiting terrorist organizations. We we'll also ensure U.S. funds are not authorized for expenditure in the territory of Gaza through any United States, United Nations entity or office unless the President can certify that the president will have to certify that it is not encouraging or teaching anti-Israel, anti-Semitic ideas and propaganda. And finally, this bill mandates that the president certify that there are no hostages held in Gaza by any terrorist organization. Senate Democrats have both, have both overwhelmingly supported this common sense measure and blocked its passage in the past. Can anybody explain that? What will it be today? I sincerely hope that Democrats will stand against taxpayer money flowing to terrorists that want to destroy Israel and still holding Gaza hostage. Let me just read the language that some people say prevents, uh, prevents uh, the um, money going to Gaza. And tell me if you come to the conclusion that this does it. The Secretary of State shall certify and report to the appropriate congressional committee not later than March 1, 2024. It's just a report. It doesn't mean they have to stop. It's just an after-the-fact report. Oversight policies, processes, and procedures have been established by the Department of State and the United States Agency for International Development as appropriate and are in use to prevent the diversion, misuse, or destruction of assistance, including international organizations, to Hamas and other terrorist and extremist entities in Gaza. It doesn't stop it, but we'll have, they'll just say we'll have policies and we'll report on the policies. Such policies, processes, and procedures have been developed in coordination with other bilateral and multilateral donors and the government of Israel as appropriate. Is, is the thing is none. Don't, don't have a, the only policy you should have is no money. Don't worry, give a report that you had a policy and it wasn't enforced. Tell me that it never happened. Then it goes on to say, the Secretary of State and the USAID Administrator shall submit to the appropriate congressional committees concurrent with the submission of the certification required in subsection A, a written description of the oversight policies, processes, and some procedures. We don't sign off on them. They're just going to give us a written description of them. We don't get to sign off on them. We don't get to question them. We don't get to change them. We don't get to vote on them. All it is is a written description. 
of, of procedures for funds appropriated by this title that are made available for assistance for Gaza, including specific action to be taken should such assistance be diverted, misused, or destroyed, and the role of Israel in the oversight of such assistance. Israel doesn't have to sign off on it. You have to be, so it just says, what role did Israel play? The answer could be Israel played no role. So there's nothing in this, there will be nothing in this bill that is gonna stop money from going to Hamas. There will be absolutely nothing. So anybody that says they are worried about um, the children of Gaza, there will be nothing to prevent money from going to Hamas instead. And I'll always say, the first thing we ought to be talking about is how do we get our hostages home? And President, I ask unanimous consent to set aside all pending amendments and motions that make my amendment 1542, pending to the text of Murray 1388. I further ask I further ask that there be two minutes of debate equally divided between the proponents and opponents, and following the use of use or yielding back of that time, the Senate vote on adoption of the amendment with a 90 or a 60 affirmative vote threshold required for adoption. Is there objection? Madam President. Senator from New Hampshire. Reserving the right to object, Madam President, we all share the grief and horror uh, that we saw unfold when Hamas committed atrocities against the people of Israel. We all continue uh, to work, as the President and his team have been doing, to find a way to get the hostages released uh, while also addressing the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. But to cut off all humanitarian aid at this point in time would mean that innocent civilian and children in Gaza would be irrevocably harmed. Uh, so we need to continue uh, as the administration is doing to develop this framework to get the hostages out and to get a pause in fighting while we do. Uh, but we also need to address the humanitarian crisis. I would also note that if my colleague uh, from Florida is interested in securing the border, uh, there was a bipartisan agreement to secure the border that Republicans turned and walked away from last week because they would rather keep this as a problem and a political issue than actually work to pass a solution. And they could have, of course, uh, after we had gone to the bill that included a border security package that was supported by the National Border Patrol Council representing 18,000 Border Patrol agents because they knew it would make our border secure. Uh, they walked away from it. Last thing I will just say is that if we are interested in standing up to authoritarians and standing for freedom, as my father did in the Battle of the Bulge in World War II, as I just heard my colleagues speak of, his uh, father did the same, then we need to make sure that we make clear to Iran and to China and to North Korea and to Vladimir Putin that the United States of America stands for freedom. And if my colleagues are serious about that, they will be supporting this bill. And with that, Madam President, I object. The objection is heard. Madam President. Senator from Florida. What we just witnessed on the Senate floor, I think, is disgusting. By blocking, all I ask for is a vote. By blocking the Senate from even voting on my amendment to add the Stop Taxpayer Funding of Hamas Act to this bill, Democrats have done the work of Hamas here in the United States Senate. Student Democrats just made clear that they are so terrified of losing the votes of radical Hamas-loving leftists, they cannot even bring themselves to vote, to vote on an amendment. Vote, all I want is vote. If I can't win it, it's my problem. To vote on an amendment that simply states that we are not gonna send money to thugs that brutally murdered 1,200 innocent people including more than 30 Americans, and are still they're still holding American hostages. We're giving money to Gazans, money goes, that can help Hamas, and they're holding American hostages, and we're gonna give money. I can't imagine this where we are, and this bill is gonna do nothing to address this while approving billion dollars of aid. We're gonna, we've got, we got an open southern border, we got hostages in Gaza, and we're going to give uh, Gazans aid that we know is going to go straight to Hamas. So if you, if you, if you look at the tests that I read, there's nothing that's going to prevent this money from going there. Um, and all my bill says is all the president has to do is certify the money's not going to go to Hamas and the money can go to, to Gaza. So, Madam President, I'm, I'm disappointed, uh, but I, and I want to re, um, wish to retain the balance of my time.